this morning. Let's all stand together and sing unto the Lord. Are you 
the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. The one who calmed the raging storm. The one who walks upon the sea Earth and heaven are your own Yet you're watching over me And how majestic is your name there is none like you. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. There is none like you. Who can stand before your throne? Your kingdom will forever reign So we will lift a song of praise To the ancient of days There is none like you And how majestic is your name There is none like you There is none like you Together we proclaim the power of your name. There is none like you. There is none like you. And there is none like you. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. There is none like you. How majestic. How majestic is your name, how majestic is your name, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is none like you, there is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. There is none like you. There is none like you. Jesus. There is none like you. Together we proclaim the power of your name. There is none like you. How much? How majestic is your name, how majestic is your name, together we proclaim the power of your name, there is none like you. All right, amen. You can turn to one another and say hello, and you may be seated.
Above all the wonders this world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're Rejected and alone, like the rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall, and thought of me. Above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before this world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders this world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. You were crucified, laid behind a stone. You lived to die, rejected. And thought of me above all, crucified, laid behind a stone. You lived to die, rejected. And thought of me above all, and like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. Thank you. Amen, Father God. We thank you so much that you took the fall for us, Lord. You died in our place and rose again that we can have eternal life and that we can meet together here in your name um, for no other reason but for who you are and what you're doing, Lord. We look forward to hearing what you're doing throughout this world. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, guys. All right. Well, um, before we start today, we have a young man who is going off to college, Aiden. This is his last Sunday with us for a while. And um, one thing about Aiden is he has been serving in this church since he was about this tall. I don't remember exactly how old you were, but uh, I remember your parents... You used to clean the church, remember that, back in the <laughs> back in the early days? And they were like, hey, you guys should start leading worship, you know? So anyways, there you are. 
So awesome. Thank you. Um, and I was thinking of a verse for you. Aiden's going off to college to Washington State University. We have a little gift for you. Aiden, you want to come up? Yeah, we have a hat. But um, first, we have this Washington State University sweatshirt for you. Okay, you might need that. And we were thinking about just a verse. I was thinking about a verse for you, right? And I was thinking of Judges 6.12, and it just simply says this. It says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And you've just proven over these years to serve faithfully to the Lord, and we just are very grateful for that. And um, we uh, want to pray for you in your next endeavor in college. It's awesome. So let's give him a hand, and we'll pray for him. So next service, act really, really surprised, okay? <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right. Lord, Father God, we just pray for Aiden. We just lift him up, Lord. We know that um, we just thank you for him, Lord, and his faithfulness over these years of, of, of just being part of this fellowship, Lord, uh, being our main drummer in this church, Lord. Thank you for his parents and what a blessing they have been and this family, Lord. We just lift them up to you. We pray, Lord, as he goes off to college, Lord, that you would strengthen him, that you would be with him, that you would um, guard and protect him, Lord, that he would be a light in a dark place, Lord. And we pray that you would bring other uh, Christians around him and to, for him to fellowship and be strengthened. And we just pray for his future, Lord, that you would just lead it and guide it. And so we just lift him up to you, and we just are so grateful for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, well, today we have a special guest with us, Wes Bentley from Far Reaching Ministries, and I just feel pretty honored to have him today, so he's going to be sharing with us. Come on up, Wes. Let's give Wes a hand, and I'll just pray one more time. Lord, we thank you for Wes, and we just look forward to hearing about Far Reaching Ministries. What a blessing it is to have him here this morning. May you speak to all of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, uh, blessed to be here. I actually head back overseas uh, a week from Monday. Uh, I know that probably most of you are not familiar with who we are, so I'll give you a little bit of an understanding. Uh, we have been involved in the longest-running civil war in Africa, the war in southern Sudan. In the last 65 years of the nation, we've had about 45 years of declared war, but there's really no time that we have not been fighting in the last 65 years, and we're fighting on multiple fronts right now. Uh, not this last summer, but the summer before last, the southern Sudan was upgraded to the third most dangerous nation in the world to live in. Uh, they say that we're fighting five different armies, and there's 148 different rebel groups that are operating in the southern Sudan. Uh, about 20, well, it's getting to be about 22, 23 years ago now, uh, we became the official training arm for the South Sudanese Army of training all pastors and chaplains for their military. And we're not like you think of chaplains in America. We are frontline combat chaplains. All of my men are armed. All of us go into battle. And I know that seems a little bit strange right now, folks, but as we get in the message, I think you'll have a little bit of a better understanding. Uh, we get the guys up at 5 o'clock clock in the morning, we run them nine miles. Uh, we go four and a half miles up a mountain, four and a half miles down, and then we have eight hours of class time and two and a half hours of study time daily. In the year that they're in training, they will go from Genesis to Revelation. Once they graduate, they're deployed to forward operation units in the South Sudan Army, where we go into extremely heavy combat. We only feed the guys two meals a day, and the reason we do that isn't because we can't afford to feed them better. We can, but if we don't train them hard, they will not survive. So we're going to show you a couple photos first to give you a little bit of idea of what we're talking about. Uh, this is the front base, uh, gate of our base. Uh, it's very deceptive, folks. It's a very large base. Over 700 people can live on this base, be trained, fed, and all the things you have to do with normal life there. Uh, next one. As you can see, we've designed it to be something like a Jerusalem or a Crusader's castle. And there's a reason why there are literally no jobs in the southern Sudan. That's why so many people are uh, joining these rebel organizations. Uh, in our village, uh, we have already built a very huge, large castle, but we're going to build 12 castle towers across uh, our village uh, on four sides of them, and they'll all be three stories high. There'll be a biblical mosaic going from Genesis to Revelation done in tile. And the reason we're doing that, we hope to bring tremendous amount of tourists in and begin to change the financial situation of the nation so that people have other options there. Uh, that's the reason why we do it. These walls are designed to stop 50 caliber uh, machine gun bullets. And if you're not familiar with how powerful that is, one bullet can just about uh, cut a man in half. Next one. Uh, 
a little problem. There it is. This is our church, uh, Calvary Chapel Cushion Nimely. Uh, we have three services. The first is in English. The second is in Arabic. The third is in Mahdi, which is a local dialect. And then we're starting a fourth one for Erin Trans that are fleeing persecution in their nation. Uh, these are just the adults uh, with the children's choir. Next one. This is our children's ministry. We get between 12 and 1,800 kids every Sunday. If it's uh, raining out, we'll get about 1,200 because everybody walks to church. Next one. These are our guys in both dress and field operation uniforms. Next one. This is a completely different place in northern Uganda. It's a school that we built for kids. Again, the reason the high walls are to stop Islamic terrorism. Uh, Al-Shabaab hit a school in Kenya a few years ago and killed over 150 children. Uh, again, we put armed guards on the walls. We have long-range thermal imaging cameras so that if the enemy comes, we can intercept them five miles out and destroy them before they get to the kids. Next one. This is the school. As you can see, it's a pretty nice school. We really do not charge the people to go there, folks. I mean, every family has to pay a few dollars a month, but the only reason we do that is we've learned over the years if it's free, they will not appreciate it, and you have a lot of problems with it. They have to have some investment. So we charge them just a few dollars a month. Next one. These are our guys. As you can see, they're pretty big boys. We train them pretty hard. Next one. In the center is the president of Southern Sudan. Uh, he came to our base about three, three years ago, uh, showed up with over 3,000 soldiers one day. I wasn't even there when he showed up. He actually slept in my bed. I thought it was so strange to think that the president of a nation was sleeping in my bed, you know. But he made a statement to the country, and he said, there's only one organization that is changing our nation. It's far-reaching ministries. He goes, they don't write books. Uh, he goes, they don't do movies. They keep their mouth shut, and they do the work. And guys, there's a lot of good other people over there, but that's the favor that God's given us. The man in the light blue jacket is the commanding general of the Southern Sudanese Army. I led him to Christ about 23 years ago. He's one of my closest friends. Uh, I was the best man at his wedding. My wife was the maid of honor. He will most likely be the future president of the Southern Sudan. Pray for him. Should he become the president, there is a high likelihood that he will declare the South Sudan to be a Christian nation. There's no nation on earth that does that that actually means it. If he does it, he will mean it, and we hope to change the face of Africa through doing that there. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. And folks, the title of the message today is called The Road to Damascus. Uh, going to Calvary Chapel, you guys are extremely fortunate because you're taught verse by verse through the Bible. So you have a little bit of a better understanding of the Word of God. There are a lot of great teachers out there that teach topical uh, studies, and there's nothing wrong with that. But until you've gone through the Bible from Genesis to Revelations, you don't really have a good understanding of what the Word of God and how it's supposed to be taught. But I still believe that there are some things that are universally misunderstood understood within the body of Christ. For example, most Christians understand that salvation is a free gift of God. There's nothing that we can do to deserve it. But what a lot of Christians do not understand is that the rewards of heaven are earned. And if we never do anything for Christ in this life, why do we expect great treasure on the other side of eternity? The Bible says in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But guys, it doesn't say they're all mansions. It says there's many mansions. I've often wondered how many one-bedroom flats or two-bedroom condos are up there. And I think it's really strange to think that if we never do anything for Christ, we expect this great treasure on the other side of eternity. Many of us become born again, and we begin to travel what I would call the narrow road. But I believe that there was a road that God intended for the church to travel that most of us will never travel, and I would call it the road to Damascus. When Saul was on the road to Damascus before he became Paul the Apostle, he was a Pharisee. He was very high in the religious order in Jerusalem. And I think that he planned to climb as high as he could in that religious order. He was a brilliant man. He had a teacher by the name of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel talked a lot about Saul. And he said the hardest thing that he found for him was enough books for him to read. He's authored many of the books of the New Testament. And I believe that the reason the Lord used him is because of his great intellect. He was able to rightly divide and put to words what the Lord wanted him to put down. Were he tested today, I believe he would test at a genius level. But see, he's received orders. He's got a real hate for the church. He believes the Christian church to be a cult. So he gets orders to go to Damascus to arrest Christians, to imprison them, and to put them to death. But as he's traveling to Damascus, he will have an encounter with Jesus Christ that will forever change his life. Whatever his ambitions were, whatever his dreams were, whatever his hopes were the day before, it all ends at that one moment in time. And I believe this is something that's supposed to happen within the body of Christ, that we're supposed to be transformed at that moment completely for the gospel. And I want to start by reading you a portion of uh, Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. 
It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house. He entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Well, folks, many people believe this is where Paul the Apostle started his public ministry, but that's not what happened at all. For the next 13, possibly 14 years, Paul the Apostle disappears. We really do not know much about his life during this time. The scripture is strangely silent on this. We know for a time that he was in Arabia, but beyond that we know almost nothing about his life. But what was ever happening, God was putting tremendously deep roots into his life. When he starts his public ministry, he will only have 21, uh, 21 years of, or 22 years of ministry before he's killed for his faith. Eleven years into his ministry, he writes the second book of Corinthians, and he talks about the suffering that he went through in the first 11 years. And he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, in danger from Jews, in danger in the city, in danger of the country, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides all these other things, I face daily my pressure and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. The reason the Jews gave 40 lashes minus one is they used a whip called the cat nine tails. It had a long rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather that hung down from it. Within the leather was pieces of bone, pieces of shell, and pieces of metal. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of your body. The reason they gave 39 lashes is most men died at the 40th lash. Now, not everybody even survived to the 39th, folks, but as a general rule, at 39 you would live, and at 40 you would die. They literally learned to beat a person within an inch of their life. And yet Paul says of his life, I count my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race which Christ has set before me. See, he was a man that was truly lost in Christ. His life did not belong to him. He was a man that was given to the things of the gospel. And you know, folks, I think about my own road to Damascus experience. It did not happen when I first became born again. I actually joined the United States Marine Corps right down on 2nd Street in Seattle when I was in the 10th grade. Uh, I lied about my age, and I went down there. I remember sharing with the, uh, the, gun, the sergeant down there. He said, son, he goes, you're not old enough to join the Marine Corps. And I said, what do we do about that, sergeant? He reached over and he changed the date. And uh, 30 days later, I was in boot camp. And I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam, and I was a pretty highly trained soldier. I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion. I trained at the Navy SEAL base, the Army Ranger base. We had our own specialized training, and I was a competitive shooter in the Marines. I used to shoot uh, battalion and division matches. I was what was called a PMI, a primary marksmanship instructor. And my coach actually said to me, he goes, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think that you could shoot the Olympics. Well, I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people, so I had no interest in going down that road there. But when the war in Vietnam got over, I decided to get out of the Marine Corps and go to Rhodesia and become a soldier of fortune. That's modern-day Zimbabwe. 
Fortunately, Christ would get a hold of my life, folks, and it would literally change everything about me. I remember that uh, I'm the oldest of four boys in my family. My sister's the youngest of the five of us. My brother Rick also followed me into the Marine Corps. He was in Special Forces. He was, uh, he was an officer. And he told my mother many years after I got saved, he said, you know, Mom, when Wes left to join the Marine Corps, he goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He goes, he was the meanest man I have ever met in my life. He goes, when he would fight people, he would purposely injure them. And he was extremely cruel with his words. And folks, I don't know that I was trying to be so cruel, but I grew up in some rough places where there were gangs, and it was never one against one. It was ten against one. So I got myself a German Mauser pistol, and I had a switchblade that was about that big. I loved it because when I pushed the button, it looked literally clacked, and it would scare people to death. And I just said to myself, if I have to kill someone, this is going to stop. Now, the other side of my personality, uh, if a young kid was being picked on, I would go to the defense of a, a handicap or a younger child. Uh, but when I got in a fight with someone, I wouldn't just quit after I beat them. I would give them a severe beating. And what I was really trying to do was send a message to other people, which was, leave me alone. And it worked quite well. But when Christ got a hold of me, it literally changed everything about me. But I would not say my road to Damascus experience came right away. I began to read the Bible as a general rule about two to three hours a day. There were days that I'd read seven, eight, nine, ten hours. But the first book that I read after the Bible was a book called Tortured for Christ, written by Richard Wombrandt. Richard Wombrandt was a Romanian pastor that spent 14 years in prison for his faith, and he was tortured extensively for the faith, folks. I remember that when I got out of the Marine Corps, I heard that he was speaking at a large church in Southern California. Now, it was not a Calvary Chapel, but the pastor of that church is one of the greatest theologians of our generation today. And I went there to hear him, and I remember that when Reverend Wombrandt walked into the church, it was a very large sanctuary, maybe 14, 15,000 people went there. I don't really remember but he walked out in the center of the aisle, and he was wearing his socks. And the reason he did that was because when he was in prison, they would try to get him to deny his faith. He would refuse to do it, so they'd lay him across the table, they'd take his shoes and socks off, and they would break all the bones in his feet. And they did this on multiple occasions. I was at Richard Wombrat's house about a year and a half before he went home to be with the Lord, and he still walked around in his socks because of the damage to his feet. See, the communist government could have easily killed him, but the problem that they had was he was a leader in the church of Romania. If they killed him, they made him a martyr. So they wanted to break him so they could break the church in Romania. So he suffered tremendously. When he got on stage, he told some of the most incredible stories of persecution that I have ever heard. I remember I have a good friend. He's also a Calvary Chapel pastor who worked for Reverend Wombrandt for a number of years. And he said one time they were going to speak in a church and they got caught in a rainstorm probably somewhere up in the Washington area, I would assume, you know. Uh, but he said when they got inside, they were completely soaked. He said, the pastor said, Reverend Wombrandt, quickly go into my office and change. You're going to be on stage in about five minutes. He said they had their luggage, so he went in there. He goes, when Reverend Wombrandt took his shirt off, he said you could see all the scars on his body, the places his body had been burned, the places had been cut. He said there were three cuts that ran from his shoulder down across his chest, his stomach, all the way down. He said there was one place on his body, though, that had a round circle, about the size probably of a half a dollar that was on the right side of his stomach, and it was black. It was also on the back of his back. And he looked at him and he said, Papa, what happened to you? He said, there was a time that they tried to get me to deny my faith, so I refused to do it. He said, though, they took an iron poker and they heated it in the fire until it turned orange, and then they pushed it all the way through my body, but I refused to deny my faith. When Richard Wombrat got done that day, folks, I said to myself, I am going to be the last person to leave this place. I don't care if it takes two or three hours. I need to understand this man's faith. But something would happen that would shock me more than anything that Reverend Wombrandt had said. When the service was over, within about 10 minutes, the entire auditorium was empty. Now, folks, there were four doors on each side and probably three or four at the back. But I watched thousands of people walk past that man. They said, thank you. We'll pray for you. Not one of them did. And not one of them gave him a gift for his ministry. And I said to myself, did these people not hear what I just heard? I know their pastor. They are well taught. The Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. So I went up to Richard Wombrandt and I said, Reverend Wombrandt, I don't know how to help, but I would at least like to write a check. Who do I write the check to? And his wife, Sabina, said, Wes, write the check to Jesus. 
So I got out my checkbook and I wrote out a check for $180. Now, folks, that doesn't seem like a lot of money, but at that time in my life, it was probably all the money that I had. And then his wife, Sabina, began to talk to me, and she said, you know, my husband spent many years in prison, but I also spent many years in prison. She goes, it was a very dark time in the history of Romania. If you were considered a threat to the state, there was no trial. All it took was for an officer to write an order, and they would take you out at midnight and shoot you in a firing squad. She said, we had a 17-year-old girl that they had determined was a threat. The order had been written, and she was to be shot that night. She said there was a great gloom within the cell because she was a young, beautiful Christian girl, and we could not understand what she had done. But all of a sudden, this young girl spoke up, and she said, me and my fiancé had hoped to glorify Christ in this life by being missionaries. But that is not how I shall glorify him. Tonight, I will glorify him with my death. She said the girl's faith was so dynamic, it was like a light came into the cell and lifted the spirits of all the women. When the guards came to take her away, she said it was a very radical scene because there were two huge men. There's this tiny, petite little girl. They're marching her off to shoot her, and they can hear this young girl talking to the soldiers. And she says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in him shall never die. And they shot that young girl that night. And guys, it would forever change my life. I would never be the same again. And I'm going to come back to this young lady in a moment and explain to you why. When I went to Africa, folks, I did not go there to be a soldier. I went there to be a pastor. I am ordained as a Calvary Chapel pastor. When you go to the mission field, you do not go there to represent your ministry, your organization, your kingdom. You are there to represent one thing alone, and that is Jesus Christ to a lost world. The Bible says it's the love of God that compels people under repentance. We are supposed to go out and behave in such a way by following God's order and his rules in the book that people look at us and say, what is it about these people? And through showing love and kindness and ministering, we bring many into the kingdom. But what began to happen was rebels began to come around and attack villages around us. One of the villages they hit, they took 58 children and they crushed their heads against trees and killed all of them. They would come in and rape all of the women from the age of nine years old to about as old as a woman could be. When they were done with them, the most beautiful, they would take into sexual slavery. Some of these rebel leaders had abducted over 70 women, other men's wives, their daughters, orphaned women. When they were done, though, the women they didn't want, most often they would just shoot them and kill them. But if they didn't shoot them and kill them, they would cut their noses off, their ears, their lips, their breasts, their fingers. They wanted to bring great terror to the people, and they were very effective about doing that. And the Lord told me, you've got to do something about this. So we began to build sanctuaries. When the sun would begin to set in northern Uganda and southern Sudan, you would see a trickle of women coming in. But by the time the sun went down, they were literally coming in by the thousands. We estimated over 44,000 women and children a night were coming in looking for sanctuary. Under every tree, under every veranda, they were trying to escape the enemy, and they were trying to escape the elements. Among the South Sudan army, they were great warriors. They are extremely tenacious in battle. But often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win a battle, and then they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages they pulled out of, me and my guys went into right afterwards. The Islamic army had come in. Everything was on fire. You could hear the popping of the rounds in the distance, the rattle of the machine guns, the thud of the mortars. And we found where the Islamic army came in, they built these huge bonfires, and they picked up all the babies and toddlers and threw them in and burned them alive. And we got there, we could see the little cranials, the little spinal cords running throughout the ash of the fire. And the Lord told me, you have got to do something about this. So I sit the men down. I said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, it is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We're men, they're women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of a man. 
We are called to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. We are called to care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. We know the tactic of the enemy. They don't hit hard targets. They don't come with 200 men and fight 200 men. They're cowards. They come with 200 men and they fight where there's five men. So if they come with 200 men one day and there's only five of us, this is probably the day that you're going to go home to meet the Lord. And you stand and you fight to the last man because in doing so, maybe another 10 or 20 women and children will escape. Guys, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that's truly terrified before, but the most vivid image in my mind was of a little girl. She's probably about two and a half years, at the most three years of age. Her mother had been killed in a rebel attack. When we found her, her mother was laying on the ground, and she was laying down holding onto the body of her dead mother. And I remember walking over and picking her up and putting her in my wife Vicky's lap, and every part of her body is trembling. Her arms, her chest, her stomach, her thighs, her calves, everything is shaking. See, what this little girl understands that many of us do not is that in northern Uganda and southern Sudan, monsters are real, and they come to kill. And the heart that we have for these children is to be able to say to them, Honey, you lay your head down tonight, and you dream. And you dream the dreams that a child is supposed to dream. Nobody's going to hurt you tonight. Not on my watch. Tonight, the body of Christ is going to wrap its arms around you, and we are going to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. Guys, when you're a soldier, you really do read Scripture in a different light. I think about King David when he wanted to build the temple of the Lord, and God sends the prophet Nathan to him, and Nathan says, David, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You could not build my temple. About four years ago, we had an enemy guerrilla unit probing our village, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 guerrillas. Our scouts had spotted them, but guys, they were elusive. Every time we spotted them, they would fade deep back into the bush. So I had to deploy them into the field. Every night we'd go out as the sun was going down, and we would not come back in until the sun was coming up. And my standing order was intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let a single one of them get away. Now, if they surrender, will I take them prisoner? Of course I will, folks. But see, if they get away, they're going to come back for the women and children. And a lot of people said to me, well, Wes, what about that scripture that says, turn the other cheek? Well, folks, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It never meant to let them rape your wives, your daughters, to sell them into sexual slavery, to torture, murder children, and burn them alive. I don't know why the church can't figure that out. Is men, we have a God-given right to protect women and children. We are living in a generation where we are raising generations of effeminate men in America today. Men do not know their role anymore. They don't understand the way they're supposed to behave. I was in Fort Lauderdale a number of years ago. I was getting on an aircraft, and this NFL star gets on the airplane. Now, guys, I don't know who he is. I don't have time to follow this. But everybody else on the airplane knows who this guy is. And he's, he's right next to me, and he's got a Louis Vuitton over his shoulder, and I looked at the guy, and I go, wait a minute. I go, isn't that a purse? He goes, no, it's a bag. I said, well, my sister has the same one, and she calls it a purse, you know. <laughs> See, we're living in a time where men do not understand their role. Men are so into fashion today. Why was that ever supposed to be important to us? Guys, I don't have a problem with men dressing appropriately, but why would it be important for a man to be into fashion? As men, we were made for battle, we were made to be in the thick of it, and we were made to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. And I think about it in my own life, if I were to try to build the temple of the Lord, I suspect God would send a prophet to me and say, Wes, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war, you're a man of blood, you could not build my temple. The great thing is, guys, is I can build his church. And I'd much rather build the church than build a building. I want to come back to this young lady now, guys, and I want to tell you why it's affected me so much and continue to all the years later. I've heard generals of the South Sudan Army talk about me. When you're the only white guy out there, you kind of stick out a bit. But I remember that I was coming around a quarter one day, and there was a bunch of officers. There was a new officer. I don't know who he was. And he said to the rest of me, he goes, who is this white man? And I heard a general say to him, you don't understand. This guy's a very serious soldier. He knows exactly what he's doing in combat, and I do. But guys, she was barely becoming a woman. She's leaving from being a young girl to being a young woman. 
And while I'm a soldier, I'm not unaware of how young girls think about marriage. Most of them dream about it their whole life. The day that they will stand there in the white dress with a veil, the vows that they will exchange, the intimacy they will share with their husband, the children and the life that she could have had with him. And all it would have taken for that young woman to have that was to say, I deny Christ. But she chose to die. I said, Lord, I am a soldier. I function quite well in combat. If this young 17-year-old girl could give so much for Jesus Christ, how much more should my life count for the gospel? King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. And guys, one of the things you have to ask yourself in your own life, has your ministry to Jesus Christ ever cost you anything? Have you ever given a donation to your home church that cost you? You say, well, I tithe. It's great that you do. But have you ever given a donation that was painful, that you actually felt it? Have you ever shared your faith when you were not sure if it was safe? Have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do? You know, I always talk to musicians, and I'll ask them, I said, what kind of ministry do you do? And they'll say, music. I said, how do you like it? I've never had one musician say to me, I don't like music. They always say, I love it. And guys, I'm not against music people. I don't want you to misunderstand me. But have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do, like child care? You know, many years ago, I went to Mike McIntosh's School of Evangelism. And during the midweek, Mike came out one night, and he said, hey, one of the ladies didn't show up for child care. We need a volunteer. Now, the guys, there were hundreds of women in that room. So I wasn't going to raise my hand. But not one single woman raised their hand. They knew something I didn't. So using a great lack of discernment, I raised my hand. I got the four-year-olds. I would rather be back in Sudan being shot at than ever go through that experience again. If I ever do children's ministry in my life again, I'm taking a gun with me. I think it's only fair. <laughs> but have you ever done anything that you did not want to do? See, the rewards of heaven are earned. And we need to be about the Father's business. You know, this is what we are called to do. I want to share with you about one of our chaplains, guys. You're going to see him up on the video in just a moment here. You'll recognize him. His name is Peter Guy. He's got a large gap between his two upper front teeth. He was killed in May of 2014. Uh, I do not know why, but in East Africa, Southern Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, if you have a large gap between your two upper front teeth, you're considered a very handsome man or a very good-looking woman. I, I don't know why. It's just a part of the culture over there. Beauty in Africa is extremely different. If you're thin, they don't think you're very good-looking over there. If you're overweight, they think you're fantastic-looking in Africa. I told my wife, Vicky, I said, honey, you got to be careful. I said, I'm like the Fabio of our village out here, you know, just <laughs> very different. But I remember that we got a radio report. Peter had been killed in May of 2014. We actually lost three guys on that day. What happened was the enemy launched a massive offensive. They came down with 7,000 soldiers. Peter's unit was the first one that was scrambled and sent to attack while other units were being assembled. They hit them headlong. They fought three major battles. It was 700 men against 7,000. 300 were killed. There were 400 men left. There was an ominous feeling among all the men that everybody was going to die. And you know what, guys? That ominous feeling was correct. Every single one of them was going to die. The only reason we know what happened is we had a fourth chaplain that was embedded with him too, who was also named Peter, and he was sent out as a runner a couple days before the final attack. And he told us about the last three weeks of Peter's life. He said, Wes, Peter was really suffering in the final days of his life. He said a month before he died, his wife left him for another man. And she said to him, I do not want to be married to a pastor. I do not want to be in the ministry. I want a better life. Now, there was no better life over there. It was just lust for someone else. But it broke his heart and it broke his spirit. But it did not break his will to serve Christ. He said, I would watch Peter. He would not tell the soldiers what was happening in his life. He would suffer in silence with other chaplains, but then he'd take his Bible, he'd go out and he'd sit down with 20 men, open up the Word of God, and 30 minutes later, all their heads would go down, and he'd lead them to Christ. And then there'd be 5 and 10 and 15 and another 20. And when he was exhausted, he would come back and suffer in silence with us. When he got his strength, he'd go out and do it all over again. He said a week before he was killed, his sister called him and said, Peter, your wife has left you. You need to leave the military, come home and take care of your family. 
And Peter responded and said, first of all, I'm a soldier in the South Sudanese army. If I were to leave, that is desertion, which is punishable by firing squad. He said, but far beyond that, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go. He goes, I was chosen by God to be here at this place and time, and I will not leave my post. We were in radio communication with him before the last battle, and the last transmission that we received was, we see a large army arrayed against us. We will call you after this battle. Guys, the call never came. All 400 men perished. We have never recovered Peter's body or our other two men. They lie among some 700 men whose bodies are no longer distinguishable by the ravages of war. But I have often thought about when Peter crossed over. See, he didn't just cross over by himself. He crossed over with 400 men that he led to Jesus Christ. Whatever the heartache, whatever the betrayal, whatever the suffering, he is a prince in the kingdom of God, and his rewards will be great. When we read the story of the ten minas, it says God gives a mina to three different men. One bears ten, one bears five, one buries it in the ground. To the one that bears ten, he says, you're going to be in charge of ten cities. To the one that bears five, he says, you're going to be in charge of five cities. To the one that buries it in the ground, he says, take it away and give it to the one that has ten. He says, but sir, he already has. He says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one that has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. And guys, what this scripture is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for Jesus Christ. Now, I've actually studied this scripture quite extensively, and I was at a conference about four years ago, probably with David Guzak, and David Guzak's quite the theologian. I asked David, I said, David, do you actually believe that we will rule over cities in the kingdom of God? He said, well, there's many theologians that believe much like the British Empire, when they had colonies all over the world, they would have a viceroy over India, Kenya, Uganda, the Sudan. We will be viceroys in the kingdom of God. Is Peter over 400 cities? I don't know. But what I do know is the Bible says the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, the mind cannot conceive the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Guys, we don't understand what the treasures of heaven are like. It's too far beyond our comprehension. You know, the Bible says when we go to heaven, God's going to wash away every sorrow and every tear. And people always say, well, that's for the loved one that didn't get saved, the wife that refused or the husband that refused Christ, the child that rejected him. I don't think it's what it is at all. I think it's when we see the lives that we could have had and we chose not to have. That's where God's going to have to wash away the sorrows and tears. One of the things you need to understand in life, guys, is that you do not get to choose the ministry often you want to do. I did not go to Africa to be a soldier. I went there to be a pastor and evangelist. Often, ministry is chosen for us by Christ to do. October of last year, we were summoned to the Capitol to meet with the general staff. And we're headed up there with our two lead chaplains, uh, Michael and Lino, and we're coming up on a vehicle about 100 yards ahead of us. And as we begin to close the distance, 75 yards, automatic firing gunfire breaks out. They kill a man and they kill a child. We hit the brakes and we went to guns, but we didn't have enough soldiers to overtake them. They abducted five children, and I don't know how many women. Guys, the children will be made into child soldiers. The women will be raped every night of their life multiple times. We had a woman that was in captivity for three years. We estimated she was raped over 5,000 times. So we radioed back for a quick response team. Fortunately, we got them on the ground quickly. We set up a battle plan. We outflanked them, and we gave the soldiers the chance to surrender. They refused to do it. So we fought it out, and we killed every single one of them. Every child and every woman came back safely. And a lot of people don't understand that because one of the things I tell people, we did not choose to do this. We were not going up there for a battle. We were summoned by the general staff for meetings. That was our only goal that day. See, we're not there to be soldiers. We're there to be representatives of Christ to a lost world. But part of being a man is you realize that you have to be strong. King David said to, King, to Solomon when he was dying, he said, Solomon, be strong and therefore prove yourself to be a man. A part of being a man is we are supposed to be strong. We are supposed to be a wall between our families and the world, the spiritual leader, the provider, the protector. And yet we are living in a generation where men are growing up to be effeminate, 
in something that they were never created to be. I don't understand it. Guys, we're going to show you this video, and then I'll come back and take a little bit of time to close. But we are involved in seven of the ten most dangerous Islamic countries in the world. We have a division of our ministry called Ghost Operations. It's the invisible hand into the closed world of radical Islam. Basically, we have pastors in the underground in Afghanistan and Pakistan under the Taliban, Syria and Iraq under ISIS and Al-Qaeda. There is a Hamas, Hezbollah, and all these other areas of radical stuff around the world. And uh, the first part is about the Syrian church. You're going to see how very difficult it is of what they're going through, but you'll be inspired by their faith also. The second part, you'll see all the chaplains that we have lost in the service of Jesus Christ. And remember Peter Guy because of the gap. Let's go ahead and show that, guys. When the war start, many problems happen, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some some day uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, that time I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together, and I said, as in Acts book, the believers when they have the persecuted most of them they go out of Jerusalem. If you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lost our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after time, I turned back to see the decision of the leaders. I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave. We will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we built a graveyard. This graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it's first uh, happened in a Raqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take it directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian, they put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, was his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they ask the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son in front of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between these uh, 
difficult and uh, bad people. You know, so sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important things for, uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life. And when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this. When I go, don't cry for me in my father's arms on me. The wounds this world left on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole Sun and moon will be replaced With the light of Jesus' face And I will not be ashamed For my Savior knows my name It don't matter where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't matter where I lay All my tears When I go, don't cry The wounds this world left on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole Sun and moon will be replaced With the light of Jesus' face And I will not be ashamed for my Savior knows my name It don't matter where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face. I'll be home and I'll be free. Folks, since the last photo you saw, we have lost 25 more men in the service of Jesus Christ. And we're going to lose a lot more before this is over with. But one of the things that you need to understand is we are winning the war for the gospel in southern Sudan. Tens of thousands of soldiers have come to know Christ and hundreds of thousands of civilians. And one of the things as believers is we need to realize that we are called to live these exceptional lives for the gospel. We're not supposed to fit into this world. The Bible, when it speaks of the church, it says we are a holy people, 
a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. The problem with the church is we're trying to fit in, and we were never meant to. The world is supposed to look at us and say, what is it about these people? We have this thought in our mind that there is a bottom that you hit, and it can't get any worse. Well, guys, after all the years of being in ministry, I've learned there's no truth in that. We began to have rebels come in our area and attack, and they would capture African families. And African families can be quite large. Four to seven kids is probably regular. 11 to 13 is not unusual. What they started doing was normally they'd take a little girl, 9 or 10 years old, and they would give her a machete and say, cut the head off your mother. If the child refused to do it, they say, if you do not cut the head off your mother, we're going to cut the head off your father, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters. And they were going to kill you. And mothers would beg their children to kill them. I have counseled these kids. There's no ability to explain that in English. We don't have words for it. I know that a lot of what we say is very shocking to you. Guys, I don't even tell you the bad stuff. It goes so far beyond this. We're not trying to shock you. We're trying to educate you. See, there are certain things that are just too perverse to share in a church. It's too inappropriate. I've always shared with people, and I know people struggle with this, but I have never had a problem with having to take human life. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. I do not enjoy killing. I never have and I never will. But when men come to rape women, to cut them up, to sell them into sexual slavery, to butcher children and burn them alive, we're going to do exactly what it takes to stop them. That's all there is to it. Many people do not know what it means to count the cost of falling Christ. You know, I do a tremendous amount of reading, and I was reading about the Knight Templars, guys. And the Knight Templars lived a 1,000 years ago. When you became a Knight Templar, you chose a life of celibacy. You were never allowed to marry. And guys, they didn't have the Bible the way we did today. They were told by the popes and the priests what to believe. So to the best of their ability, these men are trying to follow Christ. When you become a knight pimper, you never had a material possession. You were never allowed to marry. You're celibate. Their job was to protect the churches. They did pilgrimage to Jerusalem. A thousand years ago, Arabs were raiding Christian caravans, murdering people, raping the women, selling them into sexual slavery, selling their husbands as slaves. You know, Islam teaches that if you capture a woman, you're allowed to make her a prostitute. See, our world lies to us and says it's a peace-loving religion. There is nothing peaceful about Islam at all. It is is literally a, a religion of war. And the more you know about it, the more perverse you understand it is. When Saladin was marching with his army to retake Jerusalem, 140 knights found out that he was coming. So they set out to intercept him, and they found him near Nazareth because there was a natural spring there. But Saladin was not alone. He was with 7,000 Saracen soldiers. And one day's march behind was the main body of his army, which was over 100,000 men. And there were other auxiliaries and units following them. Some of the men wanted to turn and run, but there was a knight by the name of Gerard, and Gerard said, listen, men, we have been sworn to serve. We have been sworn to protect. And whether we live or we die, we will be with Christ. And 140 knights attacked 7,000 Saracen soldiers. They were utterly destroyed. The last one to fall was a man by the name of James of Malise. And when all the other knights were killed, he mounted his horse and charged 1,000 Saracens. The Saracens were so taken by his bravery, they begged him to surrender. They said, we will not harm you. We will not kill you. We will set you free. But he was sworn to protect. So he fought until they killed him. They were so taken by this, they thought that they had killed a Christian saint. They'd never seen this before. The interesting thing about this story is this is not a part of Christian history. This is not recorded by believers. All the believers were dead. This is a part of Islamic history. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your heavenly Father. I do not know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will share with you what the greatest desire of my life is. Whether it's a premonition, still small, quiet voice of the Lord, I don't know, guys. 
but I suspect that I will not live out my natural life. I have a feeling at some point I'm going to be killed in the South Sudan. And when that day comes and I stand before a holy God and I look into his eyes for the first time, I want to hear him say, well done, son. Well done. And folks, that's my prayer for you. You need to get into the battle. You're missing the war. You're not missing the battle. You are missing the war. You need to start sharing your faith. You need to start inviting people to church on Sunday. You know, guys, sometimes we, we share with people and you go right from that date, that moment, first conversation to a salvation conversion. But that's very rare. Most often it's through making friends with people and inviting them to church on Sunday. You don't even have to beat them up with the gospel. You just get them down here and you let Brian beat them up with the gospel, you know. <laughs> guys, much will be required of you. I, we had dinner Friday night, your pastor and his wife, and they have the pastor's heart. The Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. I thought about being a pastor once, but I realized that you had to like people. So I decided to be a foreign missionary. To whom much has been given, much shall be required. Don't make this a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Look for every opportunity to share your faith. Start inviting people in your neighborhood. If they reject you're not responsible anymore. But you know, sometimes you just go up and say, hey, John, many years ago I was lost and someone invited me to Calvary Chapel and it changed everything. Why don't you just see what you think? I'll take you to lunch. You'll be surprised by the end of the year how many will have come and how many will have become born again. If all of you become active, the church will triple in a year. I, I guarantee it but you've got to do your work. In closing this morning, folks, as you leave, I want to give you an opportunity. First of all, we share this with every church. First of all, we try to be very transparent. We are not a small organization. We are an extremely large organization. We're operating in 27 countries around the world. We are larger financially than most large Calvary chapels. The last three years in a row, we have put $7 million into the field all three years. We are building... We built nine Calvary chapels in Russia in the next three years, maybe four. Every Calvary chapel in Russia will have a sanctuary. We're building seven churches in Africa right now. We're building seven homes for women in Mexico right now. We are very financially secure. We don't come here because we need your money. It's like Paul said, not that we might receive, but that you might store your treasures in heaven. Your church needs your tithing. If you cannot afford to do this as a gift above and beyond, and I mean this, extremely sincerely, I would ask that you would not do it. But if you would like to be a part, we've got 400 pastors in the Middle East that we have supported. We have another 300 to go. If you would like to support one of these pastors, it's $75 a month. The only information you will ever get is what is on this card, and you'll get no update unless they're killed. We have tremendous secrecy around it, because if they are found out, they will be killed. Then we have our chaplains in the South Sudan Army. Most of my guys speak between four and seven languages. Some of them speak 13. All of these are in frontline combat units. You get an update about every year and a half if we can get them out of the field. Sometimes we can't get them out of the field because of combat. We do update you as best as we can. <laughs> Folks, it is also 75. We have a new program in Russia. It's called Potatoes for Grandmothers. And basically, guys, in Russia, the elderly are just about starving half the time. They're literally living off diets of potatoes. Uh, I've talked to grandmothers that say they can afford to drink milk twice a year. They haven't tasted meat in years. Uh, I go and open the refrigerator and there's a half a fish and there's literally a half a fish or nothing. There's no oil, there's no salt, there's no milk. And every penny we get goes to these ladies and we support them so that they can just feed them. It's just a, something that we feel, and you will get updates on your grandmother too. If you would like to do this, go back to the table do not pick them up and walk away with them. I won't know if they're sponsored. We have so many sponsorships around the world, and they're all numbered. That's how we know who we have sponsored and we don't have sponsored. We're working in many different countries with many different projects. It is an automatic debit. It comes out on the third of each month, and you do have to give us your name, address, phone number, sign it at the bottom. Voided checks work best because we don't pay fees, but you can use debit or credit cards. If you don't have your information, you want to do it, just fill it out, and then we'll call you for the rest of the information later. 
Now, the only reason I'm sharing this, folks, is because people ask me every single Sunday, they go, what if I want to do all three? First of all, we're not asking you to do that. But if you do want to do all three, it's $200 a month. And I'm saying if you could pay your tithing and it doesn't affect it at all, and you have means above and beyond, then we welcome it. But we're not doing it because we want you to feel guilty, but again, because you want to store treasures in heaven. Let me close with this, and I'm going to ask your pastor to come up and pray. Guys, the Bible says he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Every time I step into the pulpit, I thank God. Because I know that one day, I'm going to step into the pulpit for the last time. And then I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. And I do not want to miss it. We just had a refreshers course. We brought in 360 men from the front lines. And one night, we're having a bonfire. There's 360 men out there. They got their machine guns strapped around them, their bandoliers of bullets. And they got their hands up in the air, and they are worshiping Christ. And there's eight generals of the South Sudan army there. And all of a sudden, I see their heads go down, and their arms go up, and they start worshiping Christ. And I said, Father... How was I ever so blessed to experience this? How was my life ever so blessed? God created you not for the American dream. He created you to serve him. And the Bible says, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. The prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, and guys, It doesn't read well in the King James Version. It reads very well in the NIV. But in Jeremiah chapter 10, 23, he says, I know, O Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for man to direct his footsteps. Pastor, God bless you. And Lord, Father God, we do just pray for Wes and far-reaching ministries, Lord. And I know this message can be tough but good lord and so i pray that you would send your holy spirit to touch our hearts and we thank you for the honor of having uh far-reaching ministries here today and so lord be with us as we go our way in jesus name amen all right we're running a little behind so you should probably go back to the table and uh as we continue into our next service (laughs) 